You know what they'll say. Duct tape will fix anything. What's up, Disgenerates? It's the Disc Golf World. I'm Jefferson in the minivan, and alongside me, the one with all the holes in his game, Swiss Cheese. All you Patreon and YouTube members are incredibly awesome. Without you guys, we wouldn't be able to break down everything you need to know from round three of USDGC. Some people call this moving day. I call it Saturday. But growing up, I was told two things. The first, never throw a berg. The second, if you ever have a problem, nothing duct tape won't be able to solve. I'm not gonna lie. In terms of optics, it looks extremely weird that's the T-pad. I haven't even touched on the fact that there's two different materials making it up. Because I'm still wondering if the 99 cents duct tape is PDGA legal. I talked to one of the photographers who, you know, it's his job to look at disc golf through an artistic lens, and even he thought it was a joke. He suggested paint, but call me crazy, isn't this turf material right there during the practice round not look like it should be right on top of that T-pad? The reason the duct tape was even used in the first place was because it was causing confusion among pros what was actually the T-pad, which is an issue. It should be clear what is the defined throwing zone because it changes the line people can throw, and you want consistency without any worry about the near 100 competitors playing incorrectly. Round 1, it was even caught on coverage of Vino Makala having a PDGA official clarify where the T-pad ended. But what about literally every other card that didn't have the same assistance? I had to get to the bottom of this, so here's what a touring professional said when I asked about the situation. Clearly, not a fan, and there's evidence of the possibility of the hole being played wrong previously. Just feels so strange that there were so many people up in arms about standardizing T-pads, even to the point that the disc golf world had to bring it up to Jeff Spring during a press conference. Yeah, that was all the way back at the Texas swing, so I don't blame you for not remembering. Plus, there's so many more people watching our videos now, so thanks guys. And if you haven't subscribed already, what you guys doing? But back to the point. How are we okay with, let's be real, the shittiest T-pads on tour so far? We can't expect more from the every week tournament than what is supposed to be the biggest all year. And it's not like these holes were a surprise. I mean, I think this one's been being played longer than I've been alive. Drop in the comments how you feel about the duct tape. At the end of the day, I'm glad there was at least something done to solve an issue they saw. But again, they knew exactly where this tee was going to be. And there's no way in the 26 years this tournament's been being played that there haven't been plenty of complaints about this exact tee pad. You know how many pros I talked to that immediate reaction of bringing up the tee pad was how horrible it was? I know you're not familiar, but I'm talking two hands here. Tomorrow is the testing of the testing equipment over at Nevin. I'm going to try to get over there and I'll let you guys know if there's any tee pads of use talking about standardization. So if you want to see that, hit the subscribe button. But for now, Swiss Cheese got you covered with the FPO recap. Say what you will about the gray area that surrounds this Throw Pink event. Should it or shouldn't it be a major doesn't really matter because it's certainly playing like one. This event has seen highs and epic lows and you only need to look at stroke and distance adjustment as the culprit. Even through the times where it seems far too punishing, when we have to witness the strokes pile up like we had to do with Rebecca Cox on hole 12, that had her score climb like the prices for merch at the Vendor Village. She would fall 10 spots down the leaderboard due to the stroke and distance on some holes like many others. Yet it also creates that ball golf style scoring that many of you fans clamor for in the comments section, as the tournament has only seen seven players score better than four under over the first three days. Sure, it creates absolute ass backups, but also the drama and intrigue that many are looking for. That is for the ones that can look beyond the quote gimmicks of this course. And it doesn't hurt when it also helps create a battle at the top like we witnessed on day three between Evelina Salonen and Kristen Tatar. And more importantly, a return to dominance by Tatar that had been missing since her injury earlier this year. Sure, that might be difficult to comprehend and you might be looking at me crazy as she has recently notched three podiums and a victory in that span. Yet most would agree at times her game seemed off or lacking those definitive moments of dominance that we've gotten too comfortable witnessing. Today would be different. She put together the hot round of the tournament and ate under and put pressure on Evelina, something that she had yet to feel the two days prior. Though it really didn't start off that way, as Solonen, with her Johnny Cash dressed in black, stretched her three-stroke lead into five by hole seven, looking strong by hitting putts with ace runs and still in control, and most importantly, powerful off the tee. Though Tatar's dominance would see her go on a five-straight birdie run from there that had her regain the strokes she lost on the leader. 
And then 13 happened, where Tatar went OB and staring at a 64-footer, with guardians, mind you, surrounding the pin, for what most of us thought would result in a bogey. That was until she flexed her putter through the trees and into the center of the chains, reminiscent of her putt against Paige at Deglow years prior. Evelina's confidence waned from there, though perfect from C1 through 14 holes would lose her four-stroke lead on the final four holes, in large part due to her putt as she missed three C1 putts in that span, including the final hole where she had her second blow-up of the tournament, this one resulting in a three-stroke swing, setting the stage for the two to battle it out again tomorrow. But if we're being honest, Tatar certainly looks as though she has too strong of a hold on this tournament, where she has taken second two straight years. And though Charlie's really being too much by trying to call Owen Scoggins a quote dog, who you just can't count out, she finds herself currently in third place at 10 under after a 2 under round. Owen will need to put her best round or better and still will need help for a victory. Valerie Manahano edged out Chantel Miss Frisbee Badinsky, who I don't know why, just looks like she knows all the lyrics to Hot to Go for the final lead card spot, as both of them are tied at 6 under. Chantel is on pace for her best elite series finish of her career as her steady approach has gone a long way on this track. While Valerie could cap off her season with another podium finish and first since all the way back to USWDGC. Over on the MPO side, Ricky Waisaki showed why they call it moving day as he jumped up five spots, landing him on tomorrow's final day lead card. But the way he did it was the fun part. Starting off burning iconic hole one, then snagged a tap in on four, Followed it up with a huge putt staring down the water on 5. The raptor legs would just start getting warm as Ricky birdied holes 7, 8, and 9. And after enough Let's Go Ricks by Fern, decided to mix it up with a tap-in eagle on 10. But wasn't done there, as he followed it up with two more tap-ins, finishing that 6-hole stretch 7 under. Unfortunately for Rick, this is when I caught up to his card, which would start the par train. Man, maybe all those comments saying I'm ruining disc golf are right. Fuck. Oh well, with the glare off the duct tape, he skipped off the pavement on 14, which forced him to lay up for the par. Even with the absolute heater he was on, there was no reason to risk taking an even bigger number, especially with easier holes coming up. Too bad Rick would find his first and only missed circle one putt on 15. Barely squeezed past the tree on hole 16, but walked away with the bullseye. Looking down onto the island of 17, Waisaki stuck it right on the edge of the circle. Smashed the putt only for his approach in 18 the leak long and him to not break the course record. He still managed to jump Vino Makala into third place. Huge shout out our boy Vino for making the lead card as well after his best round going 6, 7, then 8 down. Nailed 10 of his 13 C1X putts, but two big birdie putts from C2 kept him in it. One thing's for sure, he's got my vote for the best mustache in disc golf. Speaking of facial hair, we have a battle at the top between the ASU graduated Pit Viper wear and Randy Johnson lover AB versus homeschooled Lego building Rubik's Cube solving pudding madman Ganon Burr. Both I'm convinced never have used a razor, but damn it, they can throw a frisbee really far. During one of his practice rounds, I had the chance to ask Ganon a few questions. This was one of them. What would winning USDGC mean to you after an already incredible season? Yeah, uh, it would just be cherry on top basically. I think it would equal that I won a third of my events this year on the Pro Tour, which would be amazing. I think two majors in one season is pretty incredible. And uh, you know, the fact I've already won this one before, I have pretty good confidence out here. I think uh, last year was a little bit of a, I don't know, bump in the road, but uh, this year I'm feeling pretty confident. I think I can just play to my landing zones, play pretty safe. I think the number one thing out here, obviously execution, but I'm going to have a very intentional game plan this week. And if I'm able to keep my head in it and execute, make my putts, obviously, that always comes down to putting. Uh, but I like my chances. With three rounds down, he finds himself just one stroke back of the lead. And what will for sure be a war tomorrow. But we still got to talk about what happened during round three. Gannon took the lead on hole one after nailing a 26-footer to get the day going. AB would find himself inside the circle for birdie on hole three to get that stroke back, but would miss. Good thing that would be the only miss C1X for the entire round. Also, he got the stroke and shared the lead back on hole four, just to go OB on five and give it right back. They would both end up parring hole seven and eight. Gannon then would find trouble on hole nine after missing his first and only C1 putt of the day to give up the solo lead. 
Now with the box on 10, AB would go over the OB, landing inside the circle for Eagle. After watching that and the pressure on Gannon, he wouldn't be able to convert and bounce. Settling for the par, and after connecting for Eagle, Varela would have a two-stroke lead. Quickly, Gannon would capitalize after an OB upshot from AB on 11. But after a big-time putt on 12 for Birdie, he would take it back from Burr. And of course would hand it right back over after an OB of his own. Managed to secure a 38-footer to save the bogey and only one stroke lost. Scary, but he's still holding on to that lead. They both would grab two easy birdies off the duct tape tee pad. Heading to 15, AB would miss the Mando, but Gannon couldn't do anything with it heading into 16 still down by one. Finished out his round with a big birdie on 16, a clutch bird on 17, and sealed the turkey on 18. Which that all sounds good and all, but AB would match that, so Burr wouldn't really get anything out of it besides staying one stroke back. Like I said, tomorrow's going to be nuts. Well, technically that's today, and I'm freaking the fuck out right now just thinking about it. It has the opportunity to be one of the greatest finishes of the disc golf modern era. Drop in the comments who you think is going to take it down. Either way, it's going to be a win for the disc golf fans. And that's everything you need to know from round 3 of USDGC. Make sure to subscribe to not miss out on the complete breakdown of the final round, plus everything else from the tournament. Thanks to the boost in subs the past couple days. Now if you haven't subscribed yet, what the hell are you doing? Make it about as much sense as using duct tape as a damn tee pad for a major. And if you want more behind the scenes USDGC coverage, consider supporting over on the Patreon. Link is in the description. Love it. One time. Dive right in. Oh. <laughs> Break, man, that would have been crazy. Holy yeah. cow. Holy cow.